Hi there, listener. This is Ian. Just a quick note on the sound quality in this episode. When I was chatting to Amy, she must have had like a super sensitive microphone on. So you can hear quite a bit of noise in the background. I don't think this detracts from the quality of the episode overall. Our conversation, I thought, was really interesting, and hopefully you'll agree too, but I'd just like to apologise for that bit of background noise. Hi there, listener, and welcome to episode 203 of the Ski Podcast. Thanks for joining us. This is going to be a Scotland special for this episode. We're going to look at resort and backcountry options in Scotland, some of the events that are on this season, as well as how to travel there by train. Plus, we've got feedback and a special question for Al about the best helmets for streaming audio. Now, my name's Ian Martin. I'd like to introduce my guest today. Uh, Technically, Amy has been on the show before because regular listeners might recognise her voice from episode 198 when she was in conversation with equipment expert Al Morgan at the ski test. But this is her first proper appearance. Amy Marwick is a freelance journalist, marketing consultant and qualified ski instructor. Uh, Hi, Amy. Welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Whereabouts are you? Uh, I am in Sheffield, a sort of grey, kind of overcast Sheffield. No snow on the tops of the the peak district? No, No, but I am actually hoping maybe this weekend there has been talk of maybe some snow falling on the peaks this weekend. So last year we did actually get up into um, when it's passed. Yeah, we managed to do a little line down there, which was pretty cool. Yeah, hopefully it was longer than the skiing I was doing in Scotland. I know sometimes (laughs) if you've got your skis and there's snow out there, you know, you need to get on it wherever. Um, I was last um, skiing in Scotland. We're going to come to that later. What about yourself, Amy? When did you last ski or snowboard last? Uh, in Scotland, uh, last time was probably last year at actually at the Brits. I went up for the for the weekend with for Fallline magazine, and, and then also managed to drop over the back and ski a couple of the gullies that were like just marginable. Ah, nice and what about the last time you're actually on snow anywhere oh on snow probably two weeks ago in chatel um, right. yeah i was teaching out there okay i did my first ski season in chatel a very long oh, uh, time okay. ago uh nice. but how, how was it out there who were you working for uh, i was out there with ski goddess where we do courses for women's women's ski courses kind of getting people better on snow and building confidence well, actually, funny you should mention Ski Dos, Goddess, because Katie has been on the podcast uh, before. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And listen, if you want to find out more about those women's courses, uh, we can do that. Right. Uh, it's been a little while since we've been on snow, but we do have some snow reports from around the world. So let's have a listen to those. Hi, this is Alex from Tip Top Ski Coaching here in Les Des Alpes with the latest snow conditions. We've had heaps of snowfall over the last few days. Uh, over 30 centimetres in the village and more up top. So the piece are groomed, soft and what we would call hero snow. The off piste is still good with plenty of fresh snow. We have got more snow on the horizon, uh, little bits and pieces over the next few days. And then the weekend is supposed to bring us another big dump of snow. So next week is looking uh, very good. Hi Ian, hi everyone. Andy in St Anton with another update. The snow in St Anton is epic, it's great. It really is wonderful. So many reports of so many places that are still green and pretty much anywhere under a thousand metres, certainly in Austria, in the very east of Austria, is quite green. Um, Most resorts under a thousand metres, the golf courses are getting ready to open and people are uh, sort of re-gripping the golf club rather than re-sharpening the skis. But St Anton remains really, really good. Uh, With the resort at 1,300 metres, we've still got snow in the resort. We had an 80, over, over 80 centimetres of fresh snow fell towards the end of last week, which gave everywhere a great covering again. And we had an unexpected 20 to 25 centimetre fresh flurry of snow for in the last 48 hours. Um, I skied yesterday. can definitely confirm that from top to bottom, so from 2,850 metres right down to the village at 1,300 metres, the snow is lovely. The piece were in great condition. Even the off piece, just off the sides, was still fresh. It really was lovely skiing. Quite a low cloud base yesterday, but above the above the cloud, everything was sunny, beautiful, gorgeous, and looking really good and pretty. Um, certainly, all the webcams they showed the very best of St Anton and the Alberg, um, with lovely snow cover all the way through to Lech and Vath and Schwachen as well. So snow conditions still really good. It's still quite cold, which is nice. 
Um, I'm just walking as I'm giving this report and my hands are actually feeling a little bit numb. So uh, that's good enough reason for me to keep this one quite short and concise. Yeah, in summary, um, good snowpack, good snow cover. I think it's fast approaching four metres at the top, um, at the very top of, the, uh, of Veluga, which is quite unprecedented to have four metres of snowfall throughout, throughout the whole season. Um, really is lovely. Come and visit. Easter's just around the corner. Um, and it's definitely some of the best skiing uh, to be had is, is, is the Easter skiing. Sun, snow, sun terraces. It really is beautiful. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hi, Ian. Alex from 150 Days of Winter with a Hail Mary snow report from the Three Valleys. You know our motto, when everyone else lets you down, you can always rely on 150 Days of Winter. Like and subscribe. Now, if you were here for the first two weeks of half term, you would have been greeted by what horse racers might call good to firm conditions. However, after all the Parisians left, so the new snow arrived. We even got an extra day of snow in February. You've got to love those Jesuit priests in their calendar. With almost fortnightly deliveries from Mother Nature, resulting in some of the best peace conditions all season. Looking at the forecast, we have over 20 centimetres to come on Sunday. So all in all, it's looking very good for March and the remainder of the season. And on that, before I go and roll around in all the fresh snow that's just fallen this morning, I wish you all a good March. Ciao. Thank you for sending in those reports. Always really interesting to hear what conditions are like around the world. And with time on snow in mind, I'd like to thank InSport for sponsoring the show. And if you want to support the Ski Podcast and save yourself some money at the same time, then just use the code Ski Podcast at InSportRent.com or take the link in the show notes and it'll automatically be done for you. Uh, I would like to thank all of our listeners who have booked with InSport already this season. Uh, not only does it mean you can save money on your ski hire in France, Austria and Switzerland, that means we can keep the podcast free from ads and, and plugs for sponsors. Right, let's move on to a little bit of news. Team GB, uh, really pleased to report that Zoe Atkin uh, picked up a couple of podiums, second and third in the Women's Halfpipe uh, World Cup in Calgary. That means she's got four World Cup podiums this season, plus she got a medal at the X Games as well. So she's having a great season. And I'm delighted to report that uh, Jasmine Taylor, picked up third in Norway. You can listen to my interview with Jazz in episode 200. I think that is the 51st podium of her career. She has got so many, she doesn't even know how many she's got herself. <laughs> but she's keeping rolling them out. Now, this is a Scotland special, and that's because I was there last week. Uh, specifically, I was based in Kalin in Perthshire. That's not near any of the five kind of official ski resorts in Scotland. Uh, but back before there were any permanent lifts in Scotland, it was the focal point of Scottish skiing. And I was there to write an article uh, about that history for The Telegraph. But that idea only came up because, as regular listeners might recall, my mother uh, was from that area. Uh, she learned to ski uh, back there in the 1950s when you had to hike up or get a lift from a tractor or a, a weasel, which is uh, like an ex-army vehicle that had caterpillar tra uh, tracks and would uh, take people uh, up onto the mountain. And sadly, I have to uh, say my mum died earlier this month, which made that trip even more poignant. And it's safe to say that if my mother hadn't loved skiing so much, I would definitely not be presenting this show uh, right now. She took my brother and I skiing every year when we were kids and working out how to afford it by hook or crook, even if that meant traveling by coach or trying unheard of resorts. That's how it would work. And I've been working in the ski industry pretty much ever since since my first ski season. As I mentioned to you, Amy, that was back in Châtel in 1988. Uh, so, yeah, I was writing an article, but this trip, which I took with my brother, was a tribute to her. Uh, now, I hope I'm not oversharing there, but it's important to understand my family link to Killin and Ben Laws before we go on to discuss it. So, uh, back to Killin. Killin is a, a village at the end of Loch Tay in, in Persia, and Ben Laws is the kind of main mountain. It's the 10th highest Munro in Scotland. They're about to 10 to 15 minute drive uh, from there or the closest you can get to it. I found out a lot about the history. It was first developed in the 1930s. The Scottish Ski Club built their first ever hut there in 1932. And actually, they held slalom and downhill races there uh, in the following years. I had the, I've talked about the Kandahar World Cup before in episode 200. They actually had a Kandahar downhill on the slopes of Ben Laws uh, in 1936. So while I was in Kalin, I visited the National Trust, who owned the Ben Laws Nature Reserve, and I spoke to the senior ranger there, Helen Cole. Right, I'm here now with uh, Helen Cole, who is a senior ranger for National Trust Scotland for Ben Laws. Hi, Helen, how are you going? Hi, I'm doing fine, thank you. Uh, we've just had a really interesting discussion about skiing in this area on Ben Laws. 
And uh, I think you said to me that National Trust originally bought the area in 1950? That's right. It was bought in 1950 to conserve the um, Arctic alpine plants that occur high up. So there's some very rare plants high on the hills. And it wasn't long after that when the Scottish Ski Club, they built a a hut there or was the hut existing already at that point? Well, I understand the hut was existing already. Uh, Apparently it was built in 1932 so it was uh, in the middle of Corrior between Mill Coronic and Ben Glass. And, and in that era, at that particular time, Killin was like the centre of Scottish skiing. There were people coming up. There were a few rope toes running. There were, we, we were trying to work out exactly where they were, but there were at least kind of two or three locations. Yeah, I understand that there were a couple of locations, uh, well, fairly close to the, the club hut, uh, one above it, I think, and one just to the west. And so people were coming up and they'd go up the mountain, either you know hiking from the road, which would be about an hour or something like that, or if they were lucky, there was this thing called a weasel that would take them up. Yes, apparently there were vehicles that took them up to the toes, and there's uh, old footage of that, apparently. I'm trying to get the permission to use that, but yeah, it looks brilliant. Uh, but the hut isn't there anymore. No, it was dismantled by the Scottish Ski Club in the mid-1990s. I, I think the upkeep of it probably became too expensive. Right. Quite difficult. If someone really did want to kind of explore and try and find it, it's still marked on the maps, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's marked. Uh, if you look on an OS um, 1 to 50,000, it's still marked there in the middle of the quarry. You can navigate to it. And right. There is a sort of little platform where it was. And there's yeah. one or two bits of debris you sometimes come across. Right. In the OK, place. well, there you go. That that would be, you know, if you really wanted to explore and do a tribute to uh, uh, the heroes and the pioneers of Scottish skiing, track it down on the, on that map. That's brilliant, Helen. Thank you very much. Thank you. So knowing the history, we were really keen to ski. The only problem was there was no snow or very little snow. Uh, we hiked up there on the Monday, saw a few ribbons. But I have to give a massive shout out to Blair Aitken. Now, if you've listened to episode 202, you'll know all about Blair. Uh, He is an expert in Scottish backcountry. I interviewed him while I was out there and put that live last week. And he really knows what he's talking about. He reckied the mountain. He found snow for us on the northeast side that we hadn't even seen. And the only catch was it was a terrible day when we went up there. But he knew there would be a weather window at two o'clock. So we slogged up there. Walked for about an hour and a half, ski toured for about half an hour in the rain and the wind. And then the clouds parted. <laughs> and I'll stick a few uh, links to some of the photos. And, you know, four or five hundred meter uh, descent. The snow was pretty good. More like spring snow, a bit soft. Amy, have you ever skied uh, on Ben Laws? Yeah, I've been up there a couple of times. Um, but both times, I think I had a very similar experience to you. Do very- you recall which, which parts of the mountain you skied? Uh, Well, I remember we just drove up a road because there's a road that you can get fairly high up. And so we drove up from the Loch Tay side and then up that road pretty much as far as we could go. And I think the first time we were there, we actually just found some snow to kind of play around on and build a little kicker. And (laughs) we were actually filming for um, a film that we were making at the time. So that section is actually in the film. And then the second time we were there just for a stomp around, see what was going on and So the road that you're talking about there, that was actually one of the crucial reasons why Killin Ben Laws became one of those first ski areas, because there's a big hydroelectric plant. There's a dam further up and they built that road as the access road. So it meant that instead of having to walk up from Loch Tay level, people were able to drive up. I think it's about 350 metres where they had that uh, original car park there. And so you're much closer to the snow and to the the hut. Have you? Do you know Blair? I've done a bit of work with Blair over the years in Scotland taking groups out. I guess you'd probably agree with me then. I mean, the guy knows exactly what he's talking about. He is the expert in that area and it was such a pleasure to go out with him. He's so enthusiastic. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is one of the I, he might call it the problem, uh, you know, with uh, Scotland. Hey, look, if you live up there and you live nearby, then fantastic. It's a lot easier if you can be spontaneous or if you can travel at short notice. I just didn't have that option. You know, as soon as we left, broadly speaking, it started to snow. And, you know, one or two days later, it was so much better. It would have been so much better than we, we were there. That doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. I had a fantastic time on the mountain and the views up there, you know, are absolutely incredible. And in fact, the day before, because uh, the conditions weren't suited on uh, Ben Laws, I decided to go over to uh, Glencoe and have a look at what we might call a proper ski resort that actually has lifts. Again, timing is everything, isn't it? It was an incredibly windy day high winds really pretty crappy weather i have to give massive thanks to uh, managing director of glencoe andy meldrum 
he lent me his own touring skis drove me up to the uh, kind of plateau area and then from there I kind of uh, boot packed for a little bit through, you know, some boggy, peaty uh, fields and over a couple of streams and then ski toured uh, up the uh, main lift to the uh, top there. And it was, you know, it was super windy, as you'll hear from this clip. Yeah, it's pretty windy up here. I've just ski toured to the top of the uh, main base in Tobar at the top of uh, Glencoe. And, you know, it's a long way from being ideal conditions, that's for sure. You can hear that wind blowing, gusting maybe 50, 60 miles an hour. There's a bit of uh, sleety, gritty snow coming down. But you know what, this is how. Those original skiers back in the 50s and earlier, before there were any lifts, they used to walk up the mountain and ski up the mountain. We'd go skiing here at Renko and Killin, Ben Laws, where I was yesterday. Wanted to get a few turns in on snow, so that's what I'm going to do now. I also had the opportunity to uh, talk to Andy just while we were waiting to go up earlier. We're in a hotel, there was a bit of background noise uh, going on, so the audio is not perfect. Right, I'm here with uh, Andy Meldrum, managing director of Glencoe Mountain Resort. Hi, Andy, nice to see you in your local area. Yeah, good morning. The last time that we met was uh, via, uh, you know, Zoom, uh, as we did back in the day. I think we're still on the tail end of lockdown when you came in and you were telling us about midsummer skiing in Glencoe. And we've just been chatting. I think it turned out there was like a midsummer ski that led to you buying the resort. Yeah, it was. We, we've been skiing, I think it's 2008, coming down the, the chairlift uh, at the end of the ski day, right at the end of the season in April. And uh, we said to the operator at the bottom of the chair, a guy called Chizzy, said, we'll see you uh, in midsummer as normal, because we've been doing it for about 20 years at that stage. And he said, oh, no, you probably won't. The business is up for sale. And we were really just being nosy at the time, myself and my brother, and we, uh, we asked how much a ski area cost to buy. He didn't know, he had no idea, but he gave us a number. We contacted them and uh, things really just escalated from there over about six months. Right, and you ended up being the owner. How long ago was that? That was back in 2008, and that was that was April, and then we took over in November, just before the ski season started. Right, okay. How did he? How do you finance buying a ski resort? Yeah, we we, <laughs> we remortgaged the house. Uh, didn't have any money. We weren't wealthy. We uh, the resort itself it wasn't necessarily it's it's not necessarily expensive to buy a resort because in Scotland there's not anything really. A, too much value. The lifts are old. Uh, most of the most of the buildings were old. A lot of the infrastructure is quite old. So we didn't pay a huge amount of money, but uh, we took on the, the risk of a business that had been in trouble for quite a number of years beforehand. So we didn't really know what we were getting into. Well, and 16 years later, you're uh, you're still running it. So something must have worked out. So I guess one of the challenges that we've seen over the last few years is global warming. But my understanding from chatting to you just now is that the way that you're managing the snow at Glencoe has improved, so you're getting much more out of it. Yeah, I think we've certainly seen warming. We've also seen more wind and more precipitation. So when it does snow, it snows heavier. When the wind blows, it tends to blow bigger drifts, which we can then move around. But when I started, we had one piece of machine. We've now got five. We've got better snow fencing, so we can move snow around. Uh, we manage it a lot better. We also put a snow blower on the front of uh, our piece of machine and will sometimes blow snow from one side of the snow fence onto the other side. The, the piece of machine drives are also really good at night. If we know it's going to, the wind's going to blow, we, we cut into the, the runs so we actually create a, a ledge and then the snow blows over and drifts in. So, you know, you're an owner of Glencoe Mountain Resort, but when you first took it over, it wasn't even called that. Is that because of the focus uh, over multiple seasons? Yeah, when we took over, it was called Glencoe Ski Centre, but we always had aspirations towards putting an accommodation and turning it into more of an activity centre, more of a resort. So that was the first thing we did. We renamed the, the business Glencoe Mountain Resort, and we did that. We put an accommodation, we put in a dry ski slope, we've developed a whole lot of other activities. The accommodation means our cafe is busy from morning till night, whereas it used to be only busy for a few hours during the day. So we now generate quite a bit more revenue in the summer, but the purpose of that revenue in the summer is so we can invest in skiing, because we ultimately, the people that operate it myself, we're all skiers, 
our snowboarders, and for us, it's all about the skiing. So when we make money, it's to invest back in. Last year, you opened a, a new chairlift on the mountain. But I think that uh, Glencoe was the first ski resort in Scotland to have what you might call a proper lift. Yeah, it was back in 1956. Philip Rankin built the first lift. It was right at the top of the hill. It went from 2,800 feet up to 3,700 feet. And people used to have to walk about an hour to get to the lift in the morning. <laughs> and unfortunately, the lift operator used to have to walk all the way to the top because it was a top drive. So he used to have to walk about an hour and a half to start the lift. So the lift only used to run when he was ready. So there was no set start time in the morning. Uh. So when people talk about earning your turns these days, when they're thinking about ski touring or something like that, they're not really considering you had to walk an hour up, you know, just in the first place, just to get to the lift. Yeah, but I think that was walking was quite a good thing because it meant by the time people started skiing, they were warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but historically that's followed through that Glencoe skiers tend to be a bit fitter and more active, less holiday makers, and we do have tracked the stats for the Scottish ski areas and. We do have less injuries. We still have less injuries because our, our skiers tend to be. I, I love I love that theory. You know that uh, if you if you're skiing in Glencoe in general, you're uh, fitter and and hardier uh, anyway. That's brilliant. That the audio on that interview with Andy it wasn't ideal. We were sitting in a hotel, uh, having a having a cup of tea. And it was perfectly quiet until we started to talk. And then all the staff in the hotel started to come in and out and slam doors, etc. But, you know, hopefully you can hear what it says. Um, Amy, have you ever skied in Glencoe? Yeah, I've been up there quite a few times over the years for various kind of free air competitions. And we used to run a junior co-cup there. We started that there quite a few years ago. And then, yeah, just for some skiing and taking a few clients up there now and again had a few days up there what were the free ride competitions you were doing so the freedom series is like the scottish free ride kind of series of competitions but i mean usually they don't all run because the weather (laughs) generally tends to storm something off over the years they have managed to run quite a few of them and they have they have done one on ben laws as well actually um and then they usually try and do one up at nevis range and then over at glencoe um and then the Junior Co-Cup is the junior version of it. So um, back in the day when we actually set up British Freeride, which was like a freeride kind of organization for junior skiers and kind of like an alternative to freestyle or racing, we set up this competition and yeah, we had a couple of years of running the competition up there and all the skiers would come and we'd send them off down the flypaper and they would throw some pretty crazy tricks, to be honest, even though they were all under 18. <laughs> right. I mean, I was going to ask you where it was. And so the flypaper, if you're looking, let's say, uh, at the mountain from below, it's over on the left-hand side, skiers right coming down. And that's that's pretty steep, right? Yeah, it's really steep, actually. Um, I think there's like a section of it that's like around 40 degrees. It's like it does really drop off as it rolls over. Um, and then there's some quite good features on the way down and a few like good launching points for all sorts. Right. And you were competing in, in this uh, in these as well. well. What kind of era was this, Amy? So this is kind of quite like 10 years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a really good. It was good fun. It's a really good, good atmosphere. People kind of all getting together and just having a ski and just trying to ski a fun line and link together some cliffs and drops and tricks and yeah it's a a good atmosphere and they usually have a bit of a party after i like i like the way you you say it so casually oh we'll just link together some uh some cliffs and some drops and things like that (laughs) fantastic and it's great to hear you know evidently now nah, the snow's not always and the weather's not always uh, predictable but you know you can have fantastic events up there and I wanted actually to ask you about an event that you mentioned to me when we were talking about doing this podcast which is a wild ski weekend can you tell me a little bit about that because it's coming up soon isn't it so it's an event at Glenmore Lodge it's a two-day event and it's really a kind of celebration of ski touring in on the Cairngorms and basically you come along you sign up to one of the courses um, which is available for all levels so they have you know everything from you've never kind of looked at ski touring gear before um, up to like people who are keen to kind of get into the gullies there's a women's course as well which is the course I usually take yeah they just get everybody out on ski touring gear and they have two days exploring and sort of just 
seeing what's possible out in the Cairngorm mountains on skis. Sorry, where are you based for that then? So it's at Glenmore Lodge. Um, so everything is based down there and they have all the kit to rent out. This year, Atomic and Scarpa and uh, Rab will be there with like gear to test out. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a great event and there's usually a apre party and live band on the Saturday night. No, it sounds like the the parties or maybe the Kayleys, if I've got the right word, <laughs> a key part of Scottish uh, skiing. Just remind me for someone who hasn't been up there before. Then, so we talk about the Cairngorms, and to most people that means Aviemore, right? And wh- where is a Glenmore Lodge? How does that fit in around that? So it's in Glenmore, which is basically right next to Loch Morley, which is kind of at the foot of Cairngorm, um, which is maybe fifteen minute drive from Aviemore, uh, and then you're right in the heart of the Cairngorm National Park. And would you tour directly out of Glenmore Lodge if the, if the snow is good enough? I mean, I think in lockdown year, it, the snow was good enough. People actually were ski touring from Glenmore up to the mountain. But I think also because the, the snow gates were closed. But no, usually we drive up to the Cairngorm base station to the ski centre uh, and then put your skis on there. Um, and then there's a few routes now preferred by the the ski centre for you to take and um, so that you're not kind of on the pistes. So I think I remember Al being on the show before and telling me about experiences up in uh, Scotland and saying that sometimes you know, out of Glenmore Lodge, you might start off on a mountain bike. So you'd somehow you'd spring your skis over your shoulder, or I don't know, put them in a pannier or something and then start off like that before you start touring. Yeah, there's a few areas, particularly if you want to access snow sort of late in the season that going by bike is going to sort of cut your hiking time by a significant margin. Um, and then you swap out, put your ski boots on, stash your bike somewhere and then carry on from there. I've never actually done that by bike, but I have also had some very long walks down the Larry Grew <laughs> with my skis and uh and my boots on my back. So yeah, it's definitely, you have to be up for a walk rather than a ski. <laughs> and that was definitely a feature of my experience, you know, last week in Scotland. There was a walk at the beginning in both uh, cases, but for Ben Laws, we strung our ski boots, skis on the backpack, ski boots kind of over the shoulder or strung over the uh, backpack. And it's, they're pretty heavy. You, you're kind of aware of it when you walk around in ski boots with them on your feet. But when you've got them over your back and you're walking up a hill, yeah. <laughs> the heavy thing you earn your turns in Scotland right yeah but those turns are so sweet when you get them because you just feel so like uh they just feel the best <laughs> for sure and any environment you know where you're ski touring to me when you're away from the lifts and you've got the mountain to yourself I mean we had the mountain to ourselves uh, I had yeah. the mountain to myself in both cases because there was no one else around Glen Coe because the lifts were closed and Ben Laws because no one else would probably even know there was snow up there to enjoy it and in Glen Coe it was a pretty rubbish day, but the clouds did part enough for me to look down over Rannoch Moor. And it's absolutely glorious, you know, that mm. view there. And the same thing up on Ben Laws, looking back down over uh, Loch Tay, uh, as Blair predicted, you know, the clouds were going to clear. We were going to have this window. And listener, have a look at the photos because I'll never do justice to explaining them. A photo is worth a thousand words, right? doesn't help me on a podcast, but I'll put it into the uh, show notes. It really was just glorious. And I, I really enjoyed doing that. I think like the weather forecast is like, it's never quite as bad as it looks on the forecast. Like once you're out there, you're kind of out there. And even if it's raining a bit, it's kind of just, you just get on with it. For sure. You know, I, I'm like that. I'm not, I don't think this is for everyone. I told my family when I got back. I mean, I've got teenage <laughs> kids. You know, they're just like not, maybe in the future they'll be like that. But right now it wouldn't be for them at all. Can I ask you another question, uh, Amy? You said uh, earlier on, I think that your last time in Scotland was for the Brits last year. And that was the Brits making a comeback. And, you know, we're not talking about, you know, handing out. Uh, awards for music here this is the brits a originally snowboarding event and then uh, i think it you know took on board you know freestyle skiing and has combined the two for many years for a long time it took place in lux uh, in switzerland covid stuffed things up and it was so good to see the brits back last year you know what was it like being there yeah oh, it was an amazing vibe and um, again it was the weather kind of came in a little bit but it actually just added to the atmosphere it was a bit foggy and misty to start with but everyone was just up there having a good time and you know all levels of skier we had some like golden oldies getting down there and winning prizes i mean when i say oldies i mean like myself <laughs> 
<laughs> like that kind of I thing. Thought, I thought, yeah, having a go at Leslie McKenna there because she told us oh, when no. she was on the podcast that yeah, she, she, she managed she to win the Brits, I think, 20 years after she'd first won it or maybe 25 years after she first won it. I can't really remember now. <laughs> yeah, it was a really fun vibe and just kind of everybody getting involved. And the, the setup they had up there was actually really impressive. Like the kickers were huge and bank slalom was great as well. It was really fun to ski down and yeah. Uh, Steve Brass and Spencer Claridge, who've been organising this event for years, they know how to do it, don't they? You know, they've got so yeah. much experience of this. They know how to uh, put it on. I interviewed Kirsty Muir last year. Let me see, back in episode 174. And she made a surprise appearance as well, I think. We talk about, you know, Olympic athlete uh, or current Olympic athlete turning up. Yeah, it was great to see, actually. I think it was really encouraging for all the like younger riders who were there to see somebody coming and just still getting involved in the grassroots experience, which was great. And I think Paddy Graham was there as well. Um, and there was lots of people filming and you know, there was a lot of activity around just making the event to something, you know, important for these kids to be at. That's really uh, exciting to hear and really interesting. I didn't realise Paddy Graham was there. I've got an interview coming up. Here's a sneak preview, listener. Uh, we're going to have an uh, episode with Paddy Graham in due course. Was he taking part at the Brits? Uh, he was definitely riding. I'm not sure if he was actually competing, but he was He was there. He was maybe emceeing the, the rail jam. A listener, you'll find out more about him when we come to that uh, episode. But Paddy Graham is one of those uh, originals on the British free rider scene who came through under the tutelage of Pat Sharples, who is a uh, now coach of the GB Snow Sports team, the Park and Pipe team, as many other people that I've uh, you know interviewed uh, in the podcast uh, over the years. What about um, the Mighty Co? That's an event coming up um, this weekend in Glencoe. Do you know much about that, Amy? Yeah, so the Mighty Co happened a couple of years ago now, and they had uh, a sort of ski test and festival up the mountain. But this year, they've kind of just set it up as a one-day event it's going to be some activities on the snow so those courses that you can get involved in some steep skiing some backcountry clinic and some safety avalanche safety skills and then in the evening they're doing a film night uh, in Fort William. The impression I'm getting here, we've got the Mighty Co this weekend, uh, the Wild Ski Weekend over in Aviemore in mid-March, 16th and 17th. Do we know if the Brits is going to happen again this year? Yeah, so that's going to be in May, but it's actually going to be down in Tamworth, Snowdome. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's more reliability. The features are not quite as uh, good, um, perhaps, but um, it's great that it's going to go ahead again. Yeah, and I think maybe easier to access for people down south. It's a, a long way up to Cairngorm so they might get a more English crowd this year. You referred to the fact it is quite a long way away and as it goes and you know regular listeners know that I'm trying not to fly or I've taken a pledge not to fly for this year for sure so I went up to Scotland uh, on the Caledonian sleeper which is a new experience for me. I've done a few sleeper trains uh, in Europe before. It is the first time I've done it in the UK. And, uh, you know, I've put a video out on the Skipedia YouTube channel. I'll put a link to it in the uh, show notes. But essentially, it's very straightforward. You know, we just turned up to Euston in the evening, hopped on the train. I was traveling with my brother. I would say that the compartments are pretty small. You can't get a big ski bag in there as well as two adults. There is a baggage uh, area in the carriage uh, down that you can go to. And, you know, they're just couchettes, they're bunk beds, uh, effectively. This is for uh, two in the classic twin, which is what I was in. I'd probably say if you're six foot tall or over six foot, it might not be the best, most comfortable night uh, for you. But for me, it was absolutely fine. And we turned up into uh, Edinburgh early on the Monday morning and just then went straight over to uh, to Killin from there. Blair actually mentioned the Caledonia Sleeper in our interview in episode 202, saying that quite a lot of his clients come up by train now directly to uh, Aviemore. So let's just have a listen to what he said. And just, uh, you know, thinking about that climate side of things, another thing we were talking about earlier, I mean, you do a lot of your courses from the Cairngorms and you mentioned to me that you're finding people, your clients, your customers, coming up from uh, down south, but by the train, the Caledonian sleeper, mm. direct to the area. Yeah, yeah, that's been, that's been fantastic this year to see so many people doing that. So taking the overnight train, arriving Saturday morning, straight up to the hill, you know, two days of courses with us and then back down on the Sunday night. Pack a lot in. Yeah, pack a lot in for sure. The reason for them taking the train, is it, I mean, there's a convenience aspect to it because you're covering a lot of ground while you're asleep. But is it also because people are thinking about their carbon footprint and trying to cut it down? 
I think it's a bit of both. It's certainly, I mean, everybody's different, aren't they? Um, we've had people that have just done it because it's a very easy day to get to, uh, easy way to get two days adventure and yeah. not any work. And we've had other people who have said they just don't, they don't fly anymore. They don't drive anymore. So they can get a train up and a bus up and be at the hill. Going from London, for example, it's, you know, it does seem hard to justify when you're almost as close to the Alps as you are to the Highlands. Figure that one out. Must be, pretty, <laughs> must be not much in it time-wise as well. But I think it's the simplicity of it that people like. While we're listening to uh, Blair just then talking about the train, uh, Amy mentioned to me there is another event going on in Kaigorm later this month. What's that one? It's the Up Battle. Um, so it's a snowboarding event. It's a like, demo day, and then they have um, a splitboard race up the mountain. <laughs> That sounds great. I love a, I love a race. I like ski touring races. I've never seen a split boarding race before. Is it harder than ski touring or is it essentially the same thing? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, it is definitely harder um, to master. It's a, a little bit less. You've got like less grip underneath you Dick, than you might do on ski touring skis because they're shorter and maybe not quite the right shape. Yeah, and they probably don't have lightweight versions either. They're all going to be pretty heavy, right? I think they are lighter than a sort of standard snowboard i'll have to ask ed lee or chris moran when they're next on the show that's great i mean it's really exciting to hear firstly you know listener we talk about scotland here it's definitely not terrible conditions the whole time the weather in scotland is unpredictable i think what amy was saying earlier you know you, you need to go to scotland with the right kind of uh, attitude in mind because the dividends when you get to the top and you come down uh, are going to be worth it and i'll definitely be going back there again you know i get the opportunity to go to uh, europe uh, quite a lot but um you know i felt that real connection to scotland you know not just through my I don't know, maybe through my family history. I don't sound very Scottish, but uh, my name is Scottish and I'm quarter Scottish. You know, I just felt a connection. I guess I just like being in uh, nature and, uh, you know, I really felt it uh, up there. Right, we're going to move to the close now. I enjoy all feedback about the show. I like to know what you think, especially about our features. So uh, please do contact me on social at Ski Podcast or by email theskipodcast at gmail.com. Had a bit of feedback since uh, our last episode. Uh, Anne Pedersen said the Norway episode, that was number 201, was excellent. Bora Wickstrom said, great podcast about Norway. By the way, Betostolen, if I've pronounced that correctly, is amazing. That's a ski resort in Norway. Uh, we had a week there in January. Super slopes, amazing for families. And they've been having an influx of happy British skiers this year. Robin also said enjoyed the Norwegian episode. He said Sunmore is definitely on the ski touring list after seeing some of the train in films by Jacob Wester and Nikolai Schirmer. Mark Woods very kindly bought me a coffee. He said, I've now listened to every past episode and I'm finally up to date. <laughs> this is great content, Ian. Excellent contributions from interesting uh, guests. He mentions uh, Al in particular. Keep up the great work. And Grant Adam also very kindly bought me a coffee. Love the podcast. Discovered it late last year and I'm working my way through the episodes. Well, thanks, Mark. And thanks, Grant. And I uh, hope you enjoy all of our back catalogue. Now, regular listeners will have heard me talk about the carve before on the show. And if you don't know it, I'd suggest you start by listening to my interview with Jamie Grant, the founder, in episode 193. But Grant also had a question about the best way to listen to Carve audio with a helmet on, as did another listener, Matthew. And he said, uh, just wondering if you've ever done a pod on helmet headphones. I'm going in on the Carve, so thinking about the audio element too. So uh, I went to our equipment expert, Al Morgan, and asked him what his thoughts were. Yeah, that's a good question. We've not done a pod specifically on these. I mean, I've tested the Alex 006 system. I found that was really good if you've got an audio compatible helmet. So where the ear pads will accept these kind of inserts, then it's it's really seamless. It, they just slip in there. You can use them to talk to your friends on the hill. But with regards carve, then you can listen to the announcement that the app's giving you as you're skiing. And it works really well. To be honest, most of the time, I've just used a single wireless earbud when testing Carve. That works fantastically well. It's the same earbuds I use daily, so I know they fit. And it means I can just pop it out and shove it in my pocket when I'm when I'm not using it. Um, the other advantage of using just one earbud is that I've still got really good hearing. But what's happening around me is something that I feel is really important when I'm on the hill, especially if you're in busier ski areas or on busier slopes. Uh, yeah, loads of options out there. Just pick one that works for you and make sure you can hear what's going on around you, really. Amy, do you have a, a view on uh, helmet headphones? No, well, I actually, I just never listen to music while I'm skiing. It's not something I've ever done. Not because I have an opposition to it in any way. I just 
never got around to it. Right. Okay. I wondered if it was like a safety thing because some people, uh, let's say, are, are, are uh, would say that you shouldn't listen to music because maybe you can't hear what's going on around you. Yeah, I suppose that's definitely would play into it and I think yeah there's definitely a safety issue if you're in a sort of busy area but um I mean don't see why it's a it wouldn't work if you're maybe ski touring or out out in the back country skiing around why not yeah well for me when I'm ski touring I'm normally listening to podcasts so oh, maybe you listening, go. you're listening to this podcast now while yeah, you're ski touring. Anyway, if you haven't listened to our equipment uh, specials with Al, I highly recommend them. They're five episodes covering skis, boots, gloves, socks, jackets, goggles, and of course, helmets. And they're all available uh, in our back catalogue. Right. If you like the podcast, there are three things you can do to help. Uh, review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Uh, that helps listeners find us. And I'd like to thank Grant for his recent review. Subscribe. It means every episode will be automatically downloaded for you so you can catch up at your leisure. Or you can book your ski hire with Intersport Rent using the code Ski Podcast, or simply take the link in the show notes. Now, there are now 200 eight episodes to catch up with and 166 were listened to in the last week and that even includes some of our olympic specials from pyeongchang 2018 which i'm guessing possibly is uh, mark who's going back and listening to every episode <laughs> they're a bit out of date now but maybe get the atmosphere and um, i'd like to thank all of our listeners a ski podcast is always in the top 10 in the Apple podcast charts. That's in the wilderness category. Sadly, there's no winter sports category. So it's normally only cycling podcasts that appear above us. But there is so much to listen to in our back catalogue. Just go along to the ski podcast.com, search around the tags and categories, and you're bound to find something of interest to you. Uh, I was just drilling down a little bit further into the stats. I saw that if you're interested, listener, 52% of us are in the UK, uh, 15% in the States. And the remaining third is spread across the rest of the world. Uh, and in the last seven days, we had listeners in Kazakhstan, Taiwan, Belize and Morocco. Uh, so, listener, wherever you're listening to this podcast, thank you for giving us your time today. I genuinely appreciate it. You can follow me at Skipedia and the podcast at The Ski Podcast. But for now, I'd like to thank Insport for supporting the show and thank all of my contributors today. That's Alex, Andy, Helen, Blair, Al and Andy Meldrum. And of course, my very special guest today, Amy Marwick. Thank you, Amy. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And finally, listener, thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.